Hello, this is Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay, and today we have a program about non-duality. And I have uh, in the studio with me Jeff Foster. Hi, hi, Jeff. Um, and Jeff got quite a story to tell in one way, and he's also a fascinating man. And I'm just going to ask him to start with, Jeff, what is non-duality? Well, that that is the question, isn't it? Um, <laughs> you know, to me. The word non-duality, it means, it means not to, and it points to this sense um, that somehow everything is, is one. Although it appears as though that there's, there's separate things in the world, you know, I'm, I'm a separate person, I'm an individual with a past and a future, and these are all separate objects. Actually, it's, it's all one. And, you know, oneness is not separate from what's happening. You know, so this, it's like, you know, this, this, the spiritual search of ours is, you know, it's really the search for oneness. It's the search for completion, the search for unity. And we all somewhere have that. I know it's inside me, to, mm. with this thing. We realise that we want something more to feel better or to feel complete. It's mm -hmm. a very human thing to have in one way. It is, yeah. And, you know, and this, this seeking begins out of the feeling of, of separation. It's because I feel separate from oneness that I begin to seek. I begin to seek. And, you know, in, in, in the material world, it's, it's the search for money, fame, better relationships, you know, a, a stronger sense of self. And, and in the spiritual world, it's, it's the search for awakening, enlightenment. Really, it's, you know, it's the same search. It's the search for completion, the search to, to come home. Um, and what I talk about really is, is, you know, the fact that you never left home and that oneness is, it's all there is. And, it, and it's here now, and we're not separate from it. And, and when that's seen, the whole search for something more just, just falls away, it just burns up. And when that happens, what does it feel like? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to talk about because, you know, when that happens, in, in the falling away of the separate self, you, you're not there. So you're not there to experience it. So when you say you're not there, what does that mean? I mean, to, to put it in simple language, I guess you could say that the past and future aren't there. This heavy sense of, you know, me being a separate person in the world. Is, okay. There's just, there's just what's happening. So and there's no one there to, to know it. It can't, it can't be known. It's like a plunge into, into the unknown, which is where we always are. But you still think, or thinking still happens yeah. about the past and future, but you're not identifying with that is that how you would say it or? yeah you know thoughts still arise thoughts can arise and it's just that they're not a problem because there's nobody there trying to get an identity out, out of thoughts trying to because that's all we seem to do we we go out in the world and we grasp at things and you know uh, we try and make ourselves into something you know, that's that's really the the uh the uh, human condition you could say it's the search to be someone the search to be something the search to, to possess, to grasp, you know. And so when that falls away, it's like everything is just released to, to, to be itself, you know, without the grasping. Without the grasping. And so in that, anything can arise. You know, th thoughts can happen, sounds can happen, smells can happen, feelings in the body can happen. But there's just, there's no sense that any of it is mine. You know, there's no sense that I'm a separate entity who, who's in control of this. It's like... Sounds happen, but there isn't a separate person there who thinks I'm hearing, I'm doing it, you know. So it's, it's almost like, you know, the me at the center of my life is, is seen to be an illusion. Life is seen to have no center, but it doesn't mean that life stops, you know, it doesn't mean that life stops. People have this idea that once awakening happens, everything somehow stops. It's like a full stop, you know, it's absolutely not. It's, it's an opening up. To, to what is, you know, it, it's an allowing of what is, but it's not something that you're doing. And that's, that's almost the hardest thing to hear. And what happens to your personality? Well, you know, it's, it's the personality that's, that's seen through. You know, the, the personality, it's seen that, that there's nothing fixed there. There's nothing fixed called me. But the personality, I presume, it's like a program that's still running. Mm. And you've still got your likes yeah. and your dislikes. Oh, it's, just, it's just that 
you're not charged so much by yeah. them. You're not, they're not dominating you. It becomes very, very playful. You know, you, you can play. It's like I, I can play at being Jeff, you know, when, it, when it's needed. You know, I can play at being Jeff. But really, this Jeff character, you know, where, where is he? You know, it's just, it's just a thought happening now. And that's not something, you know, it's not a special state that I'm in. This is true for, for all of us, you know. But it's the hardest thing to see, of course, that, that you are just a thought. Your, your whole past and future, it's just a thought arising now. Are you aware of the personality that you're seeing changing over time? Does it become more refined? Does it lose certain charges? Does it expand? Are you, are you aware of any changes? There's, I mean, it's difficult to talk about, you know, it's, um, it's difficult to talk about without making me sound special. You know, this is, you know, awakening is, it's very ordinary. It's a collapse back into what there already was, you know. This has always been here, awakening, it's always been here. It's just that we couldn't see it. I think that's the point, you know, we were so, lost in this seeking game that we couldn't see what was there in front of us you know and this is oneness already so it's like the secret of spiritual awakening is is hidden right where we are and it always has been but we can't see it because we're looking for it no i, I have a feel for that the mm. reason i particularly asked that last question was that i've, I've spent some time with people that are in a, in a, well, they feel they're in an awakened space, a realised space, whatever you call it, enlightened space. And there's no doubt there was something special. I don't mean special mm. insofar as, yeah, I do mean special, extraordinary. Extraordinary insofar as different from where other people mm. lived, the way other people lived. And yet, at times I would see that their personality would take over, not mm. necessarily for a long time, but there was influence there. Mm. And I, I'm, al I'm always interested, and I understand how that can happen, mm. but I'm always interested in the possibility of maybe the personality developing so it doesn't have any kind of hold over the, over the where I, you'd say the person is not really a person, I can get that to a degree, mm. but it doesn't have some kind of influence. Yeah. I mean, you know... Um... In, in, the, in the seeing of this, in the seeing that essentially there's, there's no me at the centre of my, of my life, there's no... I mean, this is the foundation on which our whole lives are built, that there's a, a me there. Absolutely. And everything stems from there. Absolutely. So, when that falls away, in, in the clear seeing that there's only oneness, the, you know, the mind or thought or the personality or whatever you want to call it, there's still, there can still be a momentum to that because all the mind's known is seeking for its whole life. Right. right? So that can come back in. You know, it's, it's almost like the, the moment you think you're awakened, you're not. You know, the moment you think you're awakened, you're not because the, the mind's going to come back in. Because you think you're awake. Because you think you're awake. You think you're special, you think mm -hmm. you're separate. As long as you think you're awakened, there's a you who thinks they're awakened. I get that. Yeah. That's the hardest thing to let go of. You know, that's... There was a time where I thought I was enlightened, you know, and I went around writing about it and telling people about it. And, you know, even that was just a belief. It had to be. Even that was still separation. I'm enlightened, you're not. I'm enlightened, you're not. Separation, you know? And there was a superiority with that. There was the sense that I had got something special. You know, even that fell away, because even that isn't real you know that's that's almost the final illusion to fall to fall away but it's still an illusion and you know the ego loves that the ego loves to feel that it's enlightened and go around the world telling everyone that they're enlightened of course yeah it's a great party trick isn't it it is it is it is you know and um what was seen over over here anyway was that there is no i who could be enlightened or not does this stage develop does it stage is, is not the right word probably but is this state does it develop does it evolve do you feel changes now do you feel there's a movement i've you know really there's only this there's only what's happening and everything else falls in, into the background you know and then you see in this it's, it's already complete it's seen that life is already complete you know and in that seeing yeah, you know, the, the stuff that isn't real just falls away, it just burns up, you know. And that can seem to take time. 
I can seem to take time, but really, really it's seen in clarity. There, there's only now, that there's only this. So it, in that, you know, the story of a Jeff who changes, even to talk about it just doesn't feel real to me. You know. I, I remember talking to someone um, and something very significant happened there with them and they said, it's like the background became the foreground mm. and the foreground became the background. It's like reference points almost shifted mm. and there was such there was such a strong new reference point that things they used the word like you things burnt away drifted away mm -hmm. and they saw or life was seen from a different point of view mm. was seen from a different well reference point if you like yeah and it's also seen that this has always been here it's not actually a different reference point you know i always say that i, I say you know Babies see this, you know, newborn babies see this. So when they're born, they don't f actually feel separation. Exactly. They feel interconnectedness. Yeah, well, yeah. they don't even feel that because yeah. there's just what's happening. Yeah. There's, no, okay. there's no one there who sits around and goes, I feel, I feel connected, I feel, I feel at one. No, there's just the spontaneity of what's happening. And as adults, we seem to move so far away from that, that spontaneity, that sense of aliveness, that, that, um, that simplicity in our search to, to be someone in the world. And, you know, we become very separate, very, very heavy, you know, very heavy. And we, we just miss this. We miss what's happening because we're too busy looking for something more. And it's always for me. But isn't that part of the game? That's the of game. Growing up? And there is, is, is there any way out of that? Can a baby stay in that space? I suspect not, but I, I don't know. I suspect, I think it's, it's possible, but you know, this, there's no mistakes in this, there, there, there's just no mistakes in oneness. This game has to play itself out, the separation has to happen, the suffering, in order to be seen through, you know, in all, it's, it's like the suffering, the separation is trying to wake us up, you know. And I look, I look back on my life, you know, and the intense suffering that I went through and the intense seeking, at the time it was horrible. Looking back, it was, it had to happen, you know. There were no mistakes. It was there to wake me up. Full stop. So I know when we were talking earlier, before we started recording, you were talking a little bit about your, uh, your, your, your life earlier, when you went through periods, very difficult periods, where you were very unhappy and depressed, mm. and you were exploring meditation and self-inquiry, just trying to find a way, understandably, find a way out of the uncomfortable feeling that you had. Mm. Absolutely, you know, the, the, the search was a search for an escape from this misery that I, that I was experiencing. And I, mean, I mean, really, you know, my whole life I was, I was miserable, but it reached a, a pinnacle, really. It, it, reached, it reached kind of a, a point of breakdown in my mid-20s. Mid and there was such intense suffering, misery, you know, everything, the futility of everything was seen. So what actually made you miserable? It was the futility of life? Was that, was that the core of the...? Well, it was, it was really the heaviness of being a separate person. I really felt that separation. I felt very lonely. I felt that the world didn't care about me. I, I, never, I could never really find any relationships. You know, I was always uh, very alone. So it didn't, the, kind of, the game didn't work for you It somehow. didn't work. No, it yeah. didn't work. I mean, I was blessed with a, you know, a, a, an intellect. I was quite clever. You know, apart from that, really, I, I mean, I, I hated myself, you know, I mean, it was plain and simple. I, I, I hated who I was. I hated the way I looked. I, it was just, life felt like a burden, you know, and I never, really, I never wanted to get out of bed in the morning because it was too much. It was all too much, you know, and I think really my, my whole life, more or less, I'd experienced this, you know, and of course, I never recognised it at the time. At the time, growing up, I just thought, well, that's who I am. This is my lot, you know, this but is... But did you ever try and fix the personality as such? Because people might argue that you're unhappy because your personality mm -hmm. wasn't properly formed and, and you'd had bad experiences in your childhood. I, you know, on the surface, I had quite a, you know, a, a happy childhood in a way. My parents were lovely to me. I always had everything I needed. But it was on, it was on the inside, you know, it was on the inside. It, it's, it, it was just I. It was always. It was too. It was always too much. You know. I. I. I hated who I was, and there seemed to be but no what, escape. What, but Jeff, when you say you hated who you were, how did you see who you were? Well, that's the problem. I knew who I was. And when you say you knew, it, 
you're saying that you're saying that within the definition of, of, of the area that you were separate from everybody else and you felt yeah. there was something much there was something else there yeah. you couldn't get in touch with yeah you couldn't from where you are yeah. grasp it Is yeah that... I always felt like a like a very small person in a big world you know okay I felt insignificant and I, I think really that's that's the, the, the separation taken to an extreme was where I kind of ended up, you know, we, we all feel that to some extent that we're a small person in a, in, a, in a big world and there's suffering and there's and there's death to look forward to, you know, but I, I had... It's quite a statement, <laughs> it's death to look forward to as a way I, out. No, oh. I meant that in a, in a um, ironic way, you know, it's, okay. it's, um, we all believe that we're separate people who were born and who are going to die. Well, do we really believe that? We kind of know it, we know but we it, try yeah. not to, we just think, well, not me. Yeah. You know, the thought of most of us, the thought of death is something, well, we know it's going to happen, but, oh, well, not for, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. So and we, maybe we try, not me. Yeah. You know, we try and push it aside. Yeah, we don't think about absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. But it comes out in, in other ways, actually. It comes out in, in the suffering, in the anxiety. Essentially, it's all uh, an escape from death, which is really an escape from being nothing. You know, that, that's why we, we fear death, because it's, it's a plunge into nothingness, and nothingness can't be known. And the mind operates in the realm of the known. And we fear what we don't know. And we don't understand. And we don't understand. Yeah. It's the same, it's the same yeah. thing, really. Yeah. Because what we know, we can control. Yeah. And what death is really showing us is that there is no control. You know, there is no control. And death and, and illness have a funny way of showing us this, that really, you know... There's something else going on here, and it's beyond our control. And so that's why we spend our lives, although we don't recognise it, trying to escape this um, this knowing actually that, that we are nothing. I think on some level we all know this because we've all been newborn babies. We've all known that openness, that that innocence, that sense of not being anything in particular. If we can remember it, yeah. I know for myself that's very difficult to remember anything from that time. Yeah. But the, the point is, we've all been newborn babies. Yes, we've that's all been right. newborn babies, yeah. and essentially, that hasn't been lost. It's just become obscured by the seeking game, by the illusion of being a separate person in a big world, separate from oneness. And it's out of that illusion, it's out of that assumption, really, that everything begins. That the, the suffering, the human suffering, begins. You know, and really, for for me. It reached a critical point. This, this, this suffering and this separation, um, and that's when an, another possibility started to open up. But for me, in my particular case, anyway, it had to reach that point of, you know, despair. So it went to the extreme, and then something yeah. was able to flip or well, open yeah, it was or... either. I mean, it became so clear to me it was either change or commit suicide. You know, there, there, there was no pretty other option. dramatic. Yeah, yeah, there was no other. It was it was change or suicide. But that sounds like it was, when you say that, that was the kind of option, that sounds like it was your decision to do that. Well, in, in the telling of it, you know, it always sounds like we have choice. Yeah. Uh, of course, we, we never do. It had to happen the way it happened, you know, and, you know, that there's no mistakes in this. You know, we, we think that's the illusion, really. That's where all the suffering begins is, is with the illusion of choice that I'm a person who can choose and that everything that happened could have happened differently you know which implies that this you know shouldn't be the way it is you know if it's like when it's when it's seen that it couldn't have happened differently that's the same thing as saying this couldn't be any different this has to be the way it is but Jeff when you say that you saw it was either change or suicide was there something that you felt you you did probably the wrong word, but was was it like a decision? Made? Was there something? It must have impacted you somehow inside, because that that's a very dramatic place to get well, to. Well, I mean, the, the point as a is, human being. I was I was too afraid to kill myself. You know. So you had you had no I had option. Choice. I really. had no option. I had no option. Yeah. It's a terrible situation to be in. Yeah. But you know, in hindsight, thank God it happened. You know, thank God. And then when you reached that point, did something? significant happened fairly quickly or was it another period of time or well you know it reached a, a critical point of, of misery and then I, I got physically quite ill as well I got I got glandular fever quite okay. quite a, a serious case of it and okay. um, I mean, I'll tell you how it happened you know, one one night I just um, I collapsed in my, my bathroom 
and um, I, I'd been vomiting blood um, just out of nowhere. This, you know, and I, I collapsed on the floor, passed out, woke up. I don't know how much longer later, in a pool of my own blood. And I tried to move, and I found out I was paralysed. And it, it was like, you know, I'm going to die. That's it. And it was something about that, I think. It was something about that, um, the sense of how precious this life is and how quickly it can be wiped out, you know. Yeah. Something about that stuck with me. Yeah. And a few days later, you know, I, I was lying in hospital, I feeling, feeling better, you know, they, they were treating me. And I think it was something about that experience of how, you know, it's, it's like my whole life I had never realised how precious it was to actually be alive. I just taken it for granted, you know, that the simplicity of the fact that I'm alive at all was just um, ignored, you know, in, in my search to be someone, in, in my misery. It, it was like, so it was something about that experience that, you know, it's like that, that taste of death and how close it was and how easily all this can fall away. It's like the, something about the impermanence of what we take to be our lives. Because this illness, it, this, it, this, it came out of nowhere. It just came yeah. out of nowhere. And that was, at the time, it was, that was terrifying. You know how, how easily it can be taken away, and, yeah. and a few days later, I was lying in um, my hospital bed, and you know, my whole life I had been a committed atheist. You know, the word spirituality it meant nothing to me. You know, it, it meant witches and goblins and ghouls or something. I didn't know. You know, that's what the word spirituality meant. And religions were. You know, it, it was all ridiculous to me. And for the first time in my life, you know, I I remember there was a Bible by the side of my bed. And for some reason I found myself, I just found myself picking it up and looking through it and reading the words of Jesus. And for the first time in my life it wasn't just a bunch of words, it wasn't just some man-made nonsense, you know. There was something in it, there was a resonance there, there was something about eternal life, something about the preciousness of this, something about something beyond us. I, don't, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know. But the point is there was no choice in that. And that's where it all began. That's where the seeking began. It was to find this, whatever it was. Right. This, this resonance, right. but to find it out there. And when you say the seeking began, what form did it take then? Well, it was very, for me, it was very much... I mean, I, I've been a seeker my whole life. You know, the, the, the mind is, is a seeker, you know. Um, but at that point, it was when my, my spiritual seeking really began. And, you know, I started off just by, I found myself doing this, there was no choice in it, you know, once that spark had been lit, there was no way of going back, you know, and I, I, I moved back to Manchester with my parents and I shut myself off in my room for about a year. And it started off with... Um, well, that's quite extreme in itself, almost well, shutting I, yourself off for a year. I was, very, I was a very extreme person, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I was blessed or, or, or cursed, I don't know, you know, with a very um, strong intellect, I was very clever. So once I got my, uh, my hands on something, I had to tear it apart, you know, I had yeah. to go right into it. That, that was my nature. So once that fire began, it was, you know, it was very, very intense. It was like a fire that started to burn and, you know, I couldn't put it out. And I started off with very basic books on Buddhism, Christianity, on books on meditation, very basic stuff. And then books on meditation, on self and I mean, I mean everything, just, just everything, just everything. And I, I mean everything. You know, I, tr I tried everything. And, and when you say you tried it, you would like do a certain meditation technique for a time. For a or time. A certain religion for a time. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. And there were, you know, there were, um, I started to have all sorts of spiritual experiences, you know, the, uh, glimpses of oneness, falling away of the self, you know, just uh, intense compassion, you know, um, breaking down, crying for hours at, at the beauty of the world, you know. And there were times of great despair as well, seeing the impermanence of everything, seeing that, I wasn't there, seeing that, you know, in a sense, the whole thing was futile. Um, so it was a time of, it was a very tumultuous time. It was a very dramatic time, you know, and there was old beliefs started to fall away that I'd had for lifetimes, you know, uh, when I started to see that I wasn't who I thought I was. And did you feel basically positive about what was happening or did it scare no. you or? Well, I can't say I felt positive about it. I. It wasn't particularly pleasant, actually. It, it was at, at the start. It was all very exciting, and it actually got quite nasty towards the end because the seeking became so intense. But also, I knew I couldn't give it up. You see, I knew what yeah. I knew. I couldn't give it up. Yeah. I knew that. 
I knew that. So when you say it got intense, you would do more extreme things like meditate for longer or? It was just in, in a sense of how much I shut myself off from basic ordinary life, okay. an ordinary human relationship. Like a relationship. ground in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I mean, I mean, to be honest, I don't remember a lot about those times because so much happened and so much fell away and um, I went through all sorts of state. I became a, a militant vegan at one point, you know, I was I just exploring this, this yeah. exploring everything, looking for the answers because I realised the answers couldn't be found in the way I'd been living my life. And they, they couldn't be found in having a nice job and, and finding a nice girl to marry, you know. Um, or it couldn't be found in, in the ways that I thought it could be found, you know. It, it, was, it was a clear seeing of that. And it, re it did reach a point of such intensity. I, I became, my whole identity was now I was a spiritual seeker. That, that was me. So I changed my old identity, uh, you know, for a new identity. Yeah. What I couldn't see then, you see, it was just as much of an identity as ever. You know, the, the spiritual seeker, I'm the spiritual seeker. It's still an identity, it's still something to cling to. But it, it had opened your world. Yeah. Somehow, it given you new possible horizons. I say you as an individual, but there was still, there was a movement there somehow. Yeah, it had opened so much up. And yet there was still very much a sense of, being an individual who was I looking for something. That. I understand that. That was yeah. still there, yeah. very much. Yeah. Probably heavier than ever, actually. You know? Um, at least I wasn't so miserable anymore. But I was kind of miserable in a different way because I hadn't reached enlightenment yet. I hadn't, I hadn't awakened yet. You somehow, very, you were very driven. Very. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, you know, people who come to my meetings these days and they ask me questions. Like, I've asked all these questions already. I've done everything. You know, I, I've done this seeking thing. You know, I asked every question known to man. I really did. And I mean, I think the point is I never found the answers. You know, well, I did. I, you know, I found answers and then the seeking would start again. There always seemed to be, there seemed to be this incessant movement into a future. You know, it was this constant looking for something that I thought I'd lost. And, and I see it so clearly now, as long as there was a person there looking for awakening, there was a separate person there. You know, and that's what I couldn't seem to shake off. You know, and however much I tried, I couldn't get rid of me. I couldn't get rid of the, the separate me, you know. And at one point it was seen, it was even seen that I couldn't awaken. So then, then the focus became, I have to get rid of me. I have to get rid of the self. And what I couldn't see then, you see, was that it was a self trying to get rid of a self. That's right, yeah. There's these vicious circles yeah. of thought, you know, and it got more and more subtle, actually. It got more and more subtle than the seeking... Uh, went on in more, more and more subtle ways. As the seeking was seen through in that way, it carried on. It, it's like the mind didn't want to give up. It didn't want to give up, you know. And it didn't want to give up this idea that one day I'll awaken, you know. And all I can say is that somehow in the midst of that, it all fell away. But it certainly wasn't something that I, that I did. Because in all, in all my effort to do that, I was just reinforcing the sense of me. I'm a separate person. But if you hadn't done it, would it have fallen away? I guess we don't know. Well, you do see, we? this is the, the question, isn't it? This is the central question. I mean, what was seen so clearly was that it was already here, it was already complete. Yeah. This, the awakening, the, whatever you want to call it, oneness that I was looking for, was already here. But you see, it wasn't something that I could have. It can't be possessed, it can't be grasped. And it's actually the, the grasping, the attempt to grasp it. That's how we apparently lose it. You know, it's an incredible dilemma for a spiritual seeker, and I, I would in include myself in that, in that category. It's like, on the one hand, and I've heard over the years many people talk in a similar way to you, on the, on mm. the one hand, you can't, you can't get what you want. On the other hand, you can't not try. Mm. Exactly. It's like you have, you know, you still have to live your life, you still have to follow your heart, mm. you have to follow where you feel life's taking you, and you might be, go up a thousand wrong turnings, but you somehow have to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the amazing adventure of it, really, and it's somehow very inspiring to meet someone like you, although I know you feel there isn't someone <laughs> there, but to feel that you did all this, and okay, end of the day, something mm. opened, something changed, mm. Mm. and... Your, your desperation, your unhappiness, your depression 
dropped away mm. for whatever reason. But you see, th this was seen, the beauty of this, you see, it was seen right in the midst of that despair. No, well, I, I, I can get that because mm. I've spoken to other people that have been in this situation. Mm. I, I get that, yeah. 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 yeah, all my life, well, in, in the, all the seeking, I thought the despair was a block. It's like I had to overcome the yeah. despair yeah. before I could awaken. Yeah. What, what was seen as this was already the case, right at the heart of life, what, right at the heart of what I took to be my life. It was seen that it wasn't mine at all, you know. No matter what was happening in my life, there was that freedom there that could never leave because it wasn't something that I had. It was something that, that was there and it has nothing to do with me. And yet, you see... It's what you were saying. It, it, it's like it just sits there. It just sits there and allows the seeking to play itself out, you see. Throughout all my seeking and suffering, there had only ever been oneness, just that I couldn't see it. And, yeah. yet, and yet there had still only been oneness, you see. And, and yet this whole seeking and suffering game had played itself out perfectly. That was also seen too. That was seen too that it couldn't have been otherwise, that the seeking had exhausted itself. You know, when it was ready, when it was ready, and really, it had nothing to do with me. And I remember when I, I saw this, um, I saw it in a chair, you know, I was, I was looking at, I was in my bedroom at home, and I was looking at a chair, and suddenly, it's like everything fell away, and I realised I'd never seen the chair before. Because I was too busy looking for something, looking for something so much more than the chair, looking for something for me, looking for awakening, liberation, and light, always in the future. So I'd yeah. missed the chair. And something funny happens then, you see, in that when that seeking falls away, it's like the chair reveals it, its secret, that it's already its oneness, like its oneness disguised as a chair. And actually it's not a chair at all, you see, that, that's the thing. Um, we call it a chair. It's like we call it a chair so we don't have to see it. It's like, oh, I'm, I know it's a chair, I know it's a table, I know, you know. And, but when that falls away, it's like it, it's like it can't be known, you know. It's not a chair at all, it is what it is, and it's very alive. You know, everything becomes very alive. And yeah, we can still call it a chair, we can, we can still use ordinary language, we can still function, you know, as if we were leading a very ordinary life, and yet, underneath it's seen, it, it's, all, it's all the miracle. It's all the miracle, but you, the thing is, I, I always say, it's, it's nothing like you thought it would be. It's nothing like you thought it would be. The moment you have an idea of what awakening is, that's just an idea, you know. Awakening, it's too alive to ever be captured, to ever be known. And you had a few of these experiences from, I, and there's one in your book you mentioned about how you were walking through the rain in a cold autumn evening in Oxford, and there you, yeah, there you say, um, you suddenly realised you were every, I was everything, I was home. Mm. So presumably these, these situations arose more frequently and they, yeah. and then something got stronger. Is that right? Is that how you felt? Well, you know, when, when this was first seen, it, it was very dramatic. It was very dramatic. Um, it was almost shocking to, to see that the, the secret had been with me from the beginning and it was right at the heart of this very ordinary life, you know, that the extraordinary was always there. It was always hidden in the most ordinary of, of things. And when that was first seen, there was a great excitement to it. There was, uh, there was a drama about it. It was, you know. And, and, you know, these days it's become very ordinary. The whole thing's kind of quiet. It's, it's gently kind of quieted down. It's become very gentle, very ordinary. It's there in the background, but it's not so dramatic. You know, it's like the whole thing collapses back down into a very ordinary life. On the surface, anyway. But certainly at the time there were all sorts of experiences, you know, all sorts of experiences. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, w walking in the park on that, on, that, on that day, you know, and the rain coming down and there was just this, there was just love. That's all there was and everything was a manifestation of love, you know, and nothing was separate from what I took to be myself. And at the time it was very, it was very dramatic, you know. It was very dramatic, it was also new. But really, even that's died away now, you know, even that's died away, that the, it's, it's just become very gentle, very ordinary. Was there any element of fear when these things happened at all? Anxiety? Or? Yeah, well, you see, what happens is, you know, it's like the mind falls away and there's just oneness, there's just what is, and it's so clear, it's so obvious, and it can't be known and it can't be spoken of, but it's, it's undeniably the case, you know, and 
really that there's no time to it uh, and there's no sp everything falls away but then the mind comes back in and it's then that it begins to talk about it and write about it and it says i had an experience that happened to me actually you weren't there it didn't happen to you you weren't there it's almost out of fear that the mind comes back in and tries to grasp it tries to put some sort of structure there you know the mind craves structure because it's, it's known, it, it, it's secure. See, the reason I asked that was I read this book a few years ago by Suzanne Seagull, mm. Collision with the Infinite. I don't know if you know this book. Mm. But she, she, knows she had, it would appear, similar experiences to you. And she always went through tremendous anxiety for many years. Mm. In the end, ironically, she died of a brain hemorrhage. I don't know mm. if that was part to do with the anxiety. Mm. Um, but, I, 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 you know, as you're hinting at, presumably the anxiety is to do with that the mind still, still hanging the around. still the mind hanging on. Yeah. It's, it's almost the last tactic it uses. Yeah. It uses the fear tactic, you know. Like it's, there's something to fear, there's something to fear, there's something to fear. Actually, there's just the fear. There's just fear arising. There's nothing to fear. So, no, that, that, that's an interesting subject, fear and anxiety. So, so, where you are, where you live these days, do you have fear and anxiety sometimes? Does it arise sometimes? I mean, I mean, the point is, anything can arise in, in this. It's just, it's just that, I mean, fear, anxiety, not, not really, not really anymore. Um, I'm not saying they can't arise, though, because the point about this is that anything is allowed in this. Fear is allowed in this. Anger is allowed in this. Joy is allowed in this. Sadness is allowed in this. It's like everything is allowed to arise when it arises, but there's just nobody there anymore trying to do anything with it, trying to resist it, trying to fight it, trying to get an identity out of it and it's I mean it's almost impossible to, to talk about but say that there can be sadness there you say if you know your, your mother dies there can be sadness you know, people have this idea of you know this awakened state where you don't feel anything you know it's just this empty kind of nothingness and nothing effect that's all bullshit it's all bullshit you know that's just another idea it's another concept this allows everything you know, oneness I mean how could oneness not you know oneness is everything so everything is allowed in this so sadness can sadness can be there and when sadness is there there's sadness it's undeniable but there's just nobody there anymore trying to do anything with sadness and the funny thing happens then the sadness just lives its own little life and burns itself up in its own time so it's not charged at all there's no it's not charge supported. To it. there's no charge yeah and yet so in that sadness is allowed to be fully sad you know and it can be seen it's like in the midst of sadness or anger or fear it can be seen that you know, there's sadness there, and yet there's no sadness there. And this is a place the mind could never go. Yes. The mind could never go, that there's sadness there, but because there's nobody there who is sad, there's no sad person, actually the sadness isn't there. Because really, even to call it sadness, there has to be a person there calling it something, labelling it. So, you know, I mean, it's impossible to talk about, really, and it's impossible to understand. That there's, there can be sadness there, undeniably, living its own life, and yet there is no sadness. And in that... But it's a lack of identification primarily, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's like, like you, see, you see the camera, but somehow, okay, you, you may feel at one with the camera, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how, how you look at that. <laughs> I feel the very much at two with Craig the camera. over there, but you're kind of, you're watching, is that right? You're watching something? Mm. Is, is, that, is that the right way of putting it? Maybe it's not. All, the, all this is, it's being registered. It's like it's, it's uh, effortless. You know, we think that we need to do this. We think that we need to do the hearing. We think, we think that we need to do the seeing. We think that we need to do the breathing. Actually, this is all happening effortlessly. There's, a, there's an intelligence happening here that's so... It's completely beyond the mind. The mind has no hope of grasping this. But it's, it's what is beating the heart, you know, and it's what's breathing. But that's the human body, which is an incredible, intricate mechanism. Yeah. And the point is, the human body, the body doesn't need us. It's the hardest thing to see. I understand that. Yeah, the yeah. body doesn't need yeah. us. We are yeah. really irrelevant. It doesn't need our seeking. It doesn't need our suffering. It doesn't even need our identity. You know, it functions effortlessly without us. That's, it's the hardest thing to see to someone who's so attached to their teachings and their becoming, becoming someone, to see that really you're irrelevant. You know, you're absent. You're absent. 
And yet, that, it's not a dead, cold, detached absence. It's a very alive, very full absence that's full with everything that's happening. It's very alive. Actually, that absence is absolute presence. So we, we talk about, you know, um, being present, being in the now. Actually, when, when you're fully in the now, you're not there. So really, you can't be present. It's not something that you can do. But it's there, even in the absence of you. The ironical thing, though, is that's one of the first things that you, you try and learn when you go on a spiritual path is to be present. Yeah. And you kind of, uh, you know, you can, there's the uh, sort of Bennett or Gojiev type exercises in mm. being present. Mm. So you're not spacing out because mm. most of us, it's not, that, it's not that we're, you know, you talk about being absent, but we're really absent because we're spacing out and thinking yeah, about something that's, that's else. That's the thing. That's the and thing. it's almost as if you have to learn to try and be present, and I say try and be present because that's possibly right, you can't be completely mm. present, but there's somehow a mechanism in doing that which brings you ironically closer to being mm. present than when you're just spacing out and thinking about something else and being completely unaware. Yeah. But actually what, what was seen over here was that there was only presence. There's only presence, and it actually yeah. it's not something that we have, so we can't lose it, and everything is happening within that. So even all the seeking and the spacing out and the the suffering is hap already happening in the most perfect present. It's what holds everything. So like everything is already embraced. Oneness is already embracing everything. And it, it denies nothing, it resists nothing. It even allows the most intense suffering to play itself out. But really, you know, and this is, this is seen in the, um, the, the image of the cross, you know, Jesus on the cross, that at the heart of the most intense suffering, the most intense suffering known to man, right at the heart of that, is, is God, is eternal life, is, is eternity. You know, it's not to be found through an, as an escape from suffering. It's right at the heart of suffering. And it's like right at the heart of the most intense suffering, it can be seen that there's nobody there who suffers. But you see, that's interesting because let's say we, you've probably seen the TV recently, mm. the suffering in Burma and China, mm. the cyclone and the earthquake, people lost their homes, their loved ones, they've got nowhere to live, they may be injured and there's no medical help. There's a lot of suffering there. How, how, does that affect you at all? How is that you see those pictures and you feel interconnectedness somehow mm. or interconnectedness is something happening? Well, yeah, I know it's, it's myself in, in, in Burma. It's, it's myself, you know, in the, in the earthquake, in the, you know, in, in the, um, it's myself starving in Africa. That's right, yeah. It really is, it really is, because it's all one, you know. So. People sometimes hear this, the message of non-duality and they think it's about sitting back and doing nothing. You know, they, they think it's about sitting back and just seeing, oh, it's all just a dream, it's all just a story. There's no one there suffering. Actually, in the, the clear seeing that there's nobody here who suffers, you know, and that suffering is just a story, that there can be effortless action to help where help is needed, but it comes from a place where you, don't, you just don't know. It comes from a place of not knowing, you know, it's like, I mean, the way I say it sometimes, it's like oneness recognises itself in that, that starving child and moves to help itself. Not because I'm a separate person, oh, I feel pity for you and I, I need to be a good person so I'm going to help you. You know, it's not, that's nothing to do with it. It doesn't come from a place of, of a set morality. It's like, in the seeing that it's all one, somehow, and this is the mystery of, of, of the universe, this is the mystery of the universe, somehow it moves to help itself because it only sees itself. So it sees itself as the starving child. It sees itself as the earthquake victim. And then it moves to do something, if that's possible. Or it might not, you see, it might not. But there's no way of knowing. There's no way of knowing. It comes from that place of no thought, of not knowing. It doesn't come from a place where I'm separate from you and I'm suffering because you're suffering and I feel pity for you and I'm going to try and be a good person. You know, that's, it doesn't need that. You know, the universe doesn't need our pity. It doesn't actually need our suffering. It just to see it in clarity is to end it. And then there can be a movement to help. And what form might that movement to help there's no take? Way of, well, there's no way of knowing. Yeah. There's no way of knowing. It's like the moment you have an idea of what you should do to help. The moment you have a set agenda, it's like, you know, the moment you're 
you think the most important thing in the world is saving the rainforest. You might miss the old lady who's crossing the road and who needs your help at that moment, you know? The moment you're coming from a set idea of what's right and what's wrong and what needs to be done, you might miss the old lady who in that moment is more important than all the rainforests because she's there and she's in front of you and she is yourself. So this comes from a place of, there's no structure to it, there's no way of knowing, but somehow, and I don't understand it and no one understands it, it's just the mystery of, of creation. Somehow oneness recognises itself, it's, it's God meeting himself, you know, you could, you could use the word God, it's, it's God seeing himself everywhere. So what, what motivates you and kind of keeps you going and you do your talks and you, you write books and you've got things up on YouTube and things, what, where, what form does that motivation take? You know, I really, I really don't know, I really don't know where it, where it comes from, it's, this is all, I mean, if I'm absolutely honest, the way it feels is that it's just all happened. It seems so clearly that this is really beyond my control. It's like Jeff could never have done this. The moment Jeff tried, if I'd, you know, the moment I had tried to make this happen, it would have failed miserably. This is just, I mean, it sounds almost naive. It sounds kind of, that I'm trying to be clever or something in, in a way by saying that, but that's, that's really what it feels like, you know, it really feels effortless, that it's just unfolded, it's just evolved and, you know, I don't know, I really don't know how this has happened or why it's happened, but it, it appears to have happened and somehow these, this expression of non-duality seems to come out of this mouth, you know, and it surprises me. Because you, you were telling me earlier before we started, you used to be very shy. Yeah. And you actually went into your, at Cambridge you studied astrophysics. Physics. Yeah. And you did that partly <laughs> to communicate with people. <laughs> and here you're talking away, no problem. I know. But it's, it's astonishing. I, mean, I just don't know. I, you know, I sit in these meetings or talking to you and the words come out. And so, sometimes, you know, it's almost like, if I could put it into words, it's like I sit back and watch these words coming out. And sometimes they, they surprise me. Sometimes I'm, I'm shocked at what comes out, you know, because it's almost like I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have said that. But isn't that like a little bit, if you talk to the real, or hear what they've said or written, the real geniuses of our times, you know, mm. the Einsteins and people, they don't really credit themselves, we come up with an idea, they say, well, it's, it just came. It's just coming out of nothing, it emerges, yeah. and you talk to... Um, you're, like, you're like a vehicle yeah. for something happening. Yeah, but it's nothing to do with me, though. I mean, the, the moment you... You well, this, so you're yeah. this body. I, yeah, I have it to seems use... to emerge. It seems yeah. to emerge effortlessly because it's it's talking about itself. You know, it's there's no effort in talking about this because there's no there's nothing to talk about. Uh, it's like what we're really talking about here is, is nothing. It's no object. It can't be pinned down. It can't be known. In that, it's effortless because it's really it's seen that really the moment we utter the first word about this, we're already into duality. We're already into the dream. You know, so it, it's seen, once it's seen in clarity, this really can't be spoken about. The words, and don't ask me how, they, they, they seem to come. And it's like I sit back and watch, if, if I could put it into words, it's like the, I watch these words come out and I don't, I don't know what's going to come out next. But there's, and you ask, my, my, my girlfriend is, a, is um, an artist and she talks about this. And a lot of artists talk, I've, I've talked to a lot of artists about this and they say the same thing. It's like, when you're really into the art, you know, it's, it's so clear, it's just coming out of nowhere, it's doing itself. It's emerging from nothing. You know, it's, it's like creation, it's like the point of creation. It's, it's creation and destruction, it's happening, and it's really all that's ever happening, it's happening now. This is creation and destruction, and it's, I mean, it's the, it's the miracle, really. And it, it can't be known, it can't be understood, but that's the beauty of it. If it could be understood, it would be a thing, it would be a concept. This is just pure not knowing, it's, it's openness, it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. But there's a, in the absence of that seeking, it, the mystery just reveals itself. And it reveals itself in not just the talking, but in, the, in, the ev in everything, in, in the plants and the flowers and the chairs and the trousers and tables and, you know, it's everything is the mystery. It's something coming out of nothing. It's like the very fact that this is happening at all, you know, that's, that's it, you know, that's the miracle. Well, I, I remember um, 
reading something about the formation of our planet mm. and it's you you you, you were saying telling me earlier again that that you didn't read like astrophysics because it was really just a really just uh, mathematics mm. and i was i forget I forget who wrote this but it's something about if if our planet and on a mathematical point of view was just a tiny tiny fraction different from the way mm. it was it couldn't host human life and i think yeah. that's one of the things that we forget the delicate balance yeah. of everything and that's when i get when i talk with that's 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 the feeling i get everything's incredible delicate balance yeah. you don't really know why it happens it happens the way it is and it just seems that some kind of shift in you happened all those years ago or a shift happened mm. and not much happened but it was so significant mm. and it is this kind of thing of realizing realizing how intricate and delicate and mm. fine mm. everything is and how precious it is how precious, how precious it is, it is. Yeah. and how far away from that we we move in our seeking in our search to be someone yeah that that preciousness right at the heart of life the preciousness that's really it's always there and it's always happening and we just miss it because we're too busy looking for something you know but really really nothing happened to me you know um the only difference you know it's like nothing's really changed there's still an ordinary life being lived it's just seen that no one's living that life it's living itself it's oneness playing itself out in the form of an apparent separate person you know but essentially there's no difference between between you and me it's it's oneness looking out through these eyes oneness looking out through those eyes and really oneness doesn't has no preferences oneness is equally happy looking out through these eyes and hearing through these ears as it is looking out through those eyes the only, the only thing that separates us is this story, the story of me, which is so fragile, which can fall away just like that, leaving only presence, you know, and it's, it's just the miracle that's, that's right at the heart of life, right at the heart of life, right there, you know, in the midst of the messiness of, of human life. That's, when that's seen, it's shocking because it destroys all seeking, it burns up all seeking, and it leaves you here. And people just get so lost. That's mm. the sad thing in one way, yeah. amazing thing in another way. Yeah, because it, so it could, really couldn't be any other way. And maybe yeah. that's the suffering and seeking of a lifetime. It's there to show us this. Yeah. And really nothing's out of place right from the very beginning, from the Big Bang, you know, from the preciousness of that, the, how fragile that was, that nothing's been out of place, you know. And it leaves us here. Yeah. It leaves us here. That's a great way to <laughs> finish, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank you for watching Conscious TV. I did promise Jeff's publisher that I would do a plug for his book. Here it is, um, Non-Duality Press. Thank you.